In my previous video on the SD for ST and TOS 102, I got sufficiently annoyed about the quirks of iOS 102, and by quirks I mean rubbish behaviour, that I decided I had to upgrade to 104 of TOS. I'll link to that video in the end cards. Now things didn't necessarily go as smoothly as I would have hoped. I mean Shakespeare wrote a lot of plays and a few comedies, one of which was um, The Comedy of Errors, and like a lot of Shakespeare's comedies you couldn't really consider it funny. That comment might encourage you to belt up tight. I'm channeling the great man in this one, I'm afraid, and none of it is even remotely funny. But at least it didn't end like Macbeth. If you're looking for a guide on how to do the upgrade from TOS 102 to TOS 104, this video will help. But please, for the love of all that's holy, watch it to the end. There were mistakes along the way that I wouldn't want you to repeat. But I really, I wanted to show you it warts and all because, you know, these things don't always go right. And in this case, mostly they went wrong. So the first step is to get hold of a copy of the TOS 104 ROMs. There are three ways that I can think of to do this. You can use a ROM splitter app on an ST to copy the ROM images and split them into EEPROM images and burn those to EEPROMs. Now to do this of course you need an STE with 104 already installed to bootstrap the process. If you don't have an ST with 104 installed the next alternative is to do the same thing but split them on an emulator like Atari. This is a much easier process though of slightly more questionable legality. And finally you can buy the ROMs from eBay. Right off we go to eBay. I found an advert for six ROMs, a set of TOS 104 from a seller with the fascinating name of Dog Poo Magoo. Sorry, I just find that funny. I bought them for 25 quid, which I think is a pretty decent bargain. The ROMs took a while to arrive, but when they did, it was time to open up the ST. The ST comes apart fairly easily. There are eight screws that hold the top in place. I've highlighted them here in blue. These need to be unscrewed and the top taken off. You need to take a little care when you take the top off because you have to sort of move the floppy drive end of the case slightly apart so you can ease it over, but it's very easy to do. So once the top's off, that exposes the internals of the ST, and in this case, power supply to the left, floppy drive to the right, and an aftermarket 4 megabyte upgrade module in the middle. So let's flip it back over and go to the bottom of the ST, and we need to remove the three screws that hold the floppy drive in place. These you can see highlighted in yellow in this image. When you're turning the ST back over, just remember to have a hand under the machine to hold the floppy as you go. You don't want it to fall off. There are a number of metal tabs that poke through the upper shield and are twisted to secure the two parts together. These need to be found and straightened to allow the upper and lower shields to separate. We remove the floppy drive connectors. There's a small Molex for power and a ribbon cable for data. Then we unscrew the shielding over the power supply and remove that. And the power supply connection to the main board, which is via another Molex. I mean, as usual, caution needs to be exercised when touching potentially hurty parts like power supplies. You can get a nasty shock from undischarged capacitors. The ST's power supply, though, has a metal shield on the bottom that makes getting a shock less likely, which is a nice one, Atari. Appreciate that. And then after that, there's really only the bottom part of the shield to detach from the main board, and we're ready to go. But here's the thing. I don't know if you've noticed yet. Bit of a problem. Kind of my deliberate mistake. Yeah. There's only two ROMs on the board rather than six. So mm, next time, take the lid off before ordering the ROMs. Well, there's a lesson learned already. So off we go to Amazon to order some 28 pin dip sockets. The minimum order was 17 pieces, which in retrospect was a good idea because we'd only ordered the four we needed. We'd not have been in the best of places. They arrived, packaged appropriately, in a box that was nearly big enough to hold the ST. I don't know why Amazon do this, but inside that mighty box, there's my tiny dip sockets. So the order of play is fairly simple, really. We need to remove the old ROMs, solder in the sockets, insert the ROMs, and test, which we did. And then after reassembling and taking it upstairs to my office, the ST was plugged in and I got nothing but a black screen of death. Hmm. So the ST goes back downstairs to the dining room table. I opened it up, took it apart, and I took a careful look. Can you see it? Not easy to spot, but a pin was not socketed. In my defence, I think these chips were old. They'd been desoldered and the legs were very hard to straighten and quite weak. So I straightened the pin and tried to reinsert it into the socket and bent another. And it was pretty quickly apparent that this wasn't going to work. The more modern sockets were proving hard to deal with and the space was really tight trying to line the pins. So I called upon the gods of the bodge and came up with a solution of socketing the ROM chip into a dip socket outside of the ST and then putting that socket into the actual mainboard socket. And here it is in situ. I mean, I'm not proud, but a fix is a fix. So Atari, assembled, taken upstairs, plugged in, rebooted, and 
black screen of death again. Back downstairs, with the Atari disassembled yet again, I do a little research and find out there are different revisions of my motherboard. And to switch between 6256K ROMs or 2 1 megabyte ROMs is sometimes automatically sensed and sometimes manual. Below the ROM bank are two jumpers in Atari terms, or what I would call solder bridges. So using a solder sucker, I unsoldered the one megabyte bridge on A17 and A16, checked to make sure there was no continuity between them, and then shorted the 256K bridges. Now by now, the thought of reassembling the ST and taking it upstairs just to test it was kind of getting to be a chore. So I reattached the power supply and the floppy drive and turned on the ST to see if I got a drive light and a power light. I didn't. So back to inspecting the board. I turned the board over to check the solder joints on the ROM sockets, a process I swear I had done before. And then I spot what I should have seen earlier, an entire row of unsoldered pins on the ROM slots. That's certainly not going to help. Look, I'm not making excuses here. Well, actually I am. But it isn't easy to spot these unsoldered pins and my eyes are not what they used to be. But I used a magnifier glass, a jeweler's loop, and I still didn't spot them. But a good high-res phone picture is what it took. After another power on test, I get a floppy light and a power light. So this is encouraging. So I took the computers upstairs, still only partly assembled, and plugged it in. And what I got was, hmm. But in a bizarre way, encouraging. It means for me that the processor was working, the video system was working, and I hadn't bricked my ST completely, which I really was beginning to worry about at this point. So looking up what two bombs at boot means is bus error or ROM error. And that means I could have busted my four meg RAM upgrade in this process. Now to test that, I could just remove some solder joints and go back to the 5112 memory and reboot and see if that works. The ROMs could be faulty or I could have inserted them in the wrong sockets at this point. And I could always rebridge the ROMs to be one megabyte and use the old ROMs to check that that worked. But all of these things require undoing a bunch of things that might or might not need to be redone later. So I decided on a different approach. I sent off for a diagnostic card. I've seen them used, but I've never had the opportunity to use one. And unusually for eBay, it arrived within two days. So after jumping the diagnostic cartridge for the ST, rather than for the STE, I got into the diagnostics. The most likely candidate for me was the ROMs. So I ran the ROM checksum test first. And the results were really interesting. The message said, toss is in ROM. Although six ROMs are shown, there may actually only be two. Now this set alarm bells ringing fairly quickly. So while I was searching on Google for that error message and how I might remedy it, I set a memory test off. I'm showing this on the screen. It takes quite a while actually, so I'll speed it up, but the RAM checked out okay, which was a relief. I mean, the ROM kits cost quite, sorry, the RAM kits cost quite a lot of money. But back to our error message. I found a post on atariage.com that had the answer. There aren't two jumpers that need to be bridged to set the board to use 256 megabyte ROMs, but three. And the third jumper is sneakily hiding behind the back of the MMU. Now yours will look a bit different to what you see on the screen here because I have a four meg upgrade inserted over the MMU. So I desoldered one side of that, resoldered it to 256, booted the machine and it worked. And indeed, it is Rainbow Toss. So what have we gained from upgrading to Toss 104? Well, apart from that very pretty about box, which I think you agree is worth the money in itself, we have the option to move files and folders rather than copying them. So we can hold the control key while dropping. If you're running on a hard drive with limited space, not having to copy a folder hierarchy and then delete the source is very important. The hard drive performance itself is improved and we're going to follow up on that in a little bit. File copy preserves attributes and creation dates. Again, when, when you're reliant on hard drives and you want to back them up, if the copy and paste of files change, does not change the creation date or corrupts the creation date or does not honor the archive flag, then you've got problems. There's an improved file selector, which is just a quality of life improvement. And then two, for me, very important things. Firstly, you can set a gem app to auto start at boot up. So this means if you're using a desktop replacement like Gemini, NeoDesk, TerraDesk, you can mark that app as being started when the ST starts. And so you're straight into your brand new, beautiful desktop. And I'll be covering that in a future episode. And then finally, DOS compatible disk format. 
So if you watch the previous video on TOS 102, instead of having to use apps to manipulate files uh, separately, you can just use the Finder or the uh, Explorer in Windows to drag and drop files onto your SD card, which is awesome. Although there are caveats about that, and I will actually cover them in a separate video I'm going to do on actually using the SD for ST. So I mentioned earlier that it, it was somewhat faster. So I ran Periputnik's AHPT94 disk benchmark tool on both 102 before I upgraded and 104 after I upgraded. And you can see it here running on TOS 104. My usual slight apology that my video capture card seems to be just dark, or certainly darker than it appears on a monitor. So in this test, I use the same SD card image, the same drivers, the same ST, and the only variant in the test is the version of TOS installed on ROM in the machine. And these are the results of the combined read-write tests. So four tests to take into consideration. There are the short file tests where we read and write files of size 512 to 2000 bytes. The medium file test, reading and writing 10 to 15 kilobyte files. And the long file test, where 256K files are read and written. And the final test is the access time test. This is the average time to read the contents of like tiny files. So really what it's taken into consideration is seek times, things like that. Both tests, transfer rates and read write reliability were selected. So in addition to speed tests, the app is also testing that what is written is correct. So it would flag up any read errors. If you look at the results table, I think the results are pretty stunning, frankly. TOS 104 is reading data at 144 to 147% of that which TOS 102 did. The improvement in writing data is almost insane at 544 to 1460% of the original TOS version. Now, the value at the top for write on short files for TOS 102 looks anomalous. So I've just rejected it. I don't know if that was a bug in the test or just TOS 102. Finally, the access time is similarly better, TOS 104 to 102 at 69% of the time taken in 102. So it's come down, which is what you want. And it's interesting that that's totally down to the operating system. It's not down to using a better SD card or anything like that. Because obviously the type of SD card you use or the interface, like say an ultra certain versus a SD for SC, will have an effect on speed. But like I say, everything was invariant apart from the version of TOS. So rhetorical question. Was it worth it to upgrade from TOS 102 to 104? And the answer to that is self-evidently, yes, it was. Was it easy? Well, certainly not in this case. Would I do it again on another ST in the future? I absolutely would. But I would check whether I was using two ROMs or six ROMs at the start of the process. Buy only ROMs of the same ROM count, so I don't have to do any soldering. But the thing is as well, going to ROM sets above 104 is only possible using two ROM sets because the ROM sizes were bigger. So when you get the TOS 1.06 and then normally you're dealing with Atari STEs, they only had two sockets anyway, so it's a bit of a moot point. I just hit the perfect sweet point for things to go wrong. But I had a lot of fun doing this upgrade. I mean, not everything went to plan, but it's always worth remembering that the computer is the hobby. Tinkering with them, upgrading them, occasionally nearly breaking them. That's what they're for. If I want to surf the net or tweet, I'll use a boring modern PC or Mac. If you have any questions about the process or opinions on how rubbish I am, please feel free to chat in the comments. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.